Hello there, friend. If you ever try to imagine what the world of tomorrow would be like, well, let's just have a peek 60 years into the future then. The 21st century. Mechanical robots and electronic brains have long surpassed human intelligence. Well, actually world politics is controlled by a supercomputer. Man and machine communicate at lightning speed by sending ether waves across the cosmos. You want to live in that world today, you say? Well, this will make a good start. The Brown PKG5 vacuum tube music console, AM and FM radio, a baffling 7 watts of mono power amplifier output, and a state-of-the-art turntable, all combined with the sleek looks of the 21st century. Make 1958 like 2018 and buy the Brown PKG5. Hello guys, as you can see today's episode is about this vacuum tube music console here. I'll show you how I repaired it and then in the end of the video we'll actually listen to a record. And as you might know some of my work revolves around retro futurism, an idea that I'm really fascinated by. And this console here represents an actual futuristic vision from well around the middle of the 20th century when the German company Braun dared to design a whole line of products that looked completely differently from the norm at the time. So before we get to the actual repair job, let's take a look at some of the products that Braun designed back in the day. Most of you have probably heard of the name Braun from toothbrushes or razors because these are products that are still being sold today under that brand name. But until the 1980s, Braun actually manufactured and sold a whole variety of electronic appliances, including TVs and audio electronics. These products were usually innovative in style, exquisite in quality, but also prohibitively expensive. And that's why Braun, as a manufacturer of audio equipment, probably never became as popular or well-known as other bigger German manufacturers like Grundig or Telefunken. A number of years back, I started to collect and repair old Brown amplifiers, radios and other electronic equipment because at least the broken units were really cheap on eBay and it was fun to repair them because the manufacturing quality of these devices is in my experience higher than that of any other big audio equipment manufacturer except maybe for Revox, which I think is on the same level. And this Brown PKG5 music console was built in 1957. And when you compare it to the style of other radios of that era like this Nordman de Rigoletto 55 from 1955, you can clearly see a stark contrast in the design. While the Brown devices tried to look futuristic in a way, these radios had an anachronistic or even historistic style in that they mimic the looks of a bygone era. What I mean by that is that they look much more old fashioned than actual industrial or military electronics from that same age and that I think is because people at that time liked their houses to look like castles from the 18th or 19th century and these radios I think were made to fit right in with that idea. But enough history for now, let's get this console running again. But before turning it on for the first time, let's remove the back cover, which, like with most radios of this era, is basically just a piece of thick cardboard. And right now we see the first defect here. And this probably just came to be while this console was transported here. This ferrite rod antenna here has gotten loose and I will later have to glue it back in place. And as always, before starting to repair anything, I clean the device inside and out here with compressed air and I take my time for a visual inspection. Second light burned through. Machine is warming up. Muslim mit algerischem Stiefvater. Wenn das kein Zeichen setzte, so geht Integration. FM Radio works great, but we can't listen to any music stations because of copyright issues that will come with that. Kurz, that's shortwave, so we are at AM Radio. And as you can see, the knob turns, but apparently the actual variable capacitor that uh, is used to adjust the tuner doesn't work. 
This is just a spring being pulled back and forth. It will be the same with middle wave and long wave as well. Volume button doesn't work, it's stuck. The record player actually works, but I had to mute this recording to prevent copyright strikes here on YouTube. But we'll listen to another rather obscure record later in this video. But let's sum it up. FM radio works, which tells us that the pre-amplifier and the power amplifier also work, but the volume pod is stuck. AM radio seems to work in theory, but the variable capacitor for AM radio is also stuck. One of the backlights is broken and the ferrite rod antenna is loose. We are lucky, because these are all primitive mechanical faults, which are trivial in comparison to actually tracing electronic faults within this device's circuitry. However, repairing them will still require a lot of precision handiwork. And in order to fix all of these things, we have to remove the chassis from inside the wooden enclosure. For that though, a number of wire connections have to be temporarily disconnected. The wires leading from the output transformer to the loudspeakers have to be desoldered. A wire leading from the radio's chassis ground to a metal shield underneath it also has to be loosened. Two wires leading from various audio input jacks on the backside of the device, here in order to connect an external record player or tape recorder to the pre-amplifier section of this device, also have to be desoldered. And the same has to happen with the power cord of the internal record player. And then after unscrewing four screws on the bottom side, we can finally pull out the chassis. One word of warning, this is a vacuum tube device. And vacuum tubes run on much higher voltages than your typical transistor based electronics of today. Inside this device are a number of capacitors that can hold a dangerous charge. And if you would ever attempt something like this yourself, make sure to discharge them safely before handling them. And our stuck volume adjustment potentiometer is here in the upper right corner. And within the circuit diagram, we can find that right here. And let me magnify that. I know it still looks a little crowded here because of all these capacitors and resistors but they are not part of the actual volume adjustment. When it just comes to volume adjustment, we really just have a, well, adjustable voltage divider with an input voltage and an output voltage at the tap, both in reference to the same chassis ground, with the output voltage smaller than the input voltage. And while you turn the pot, you can, well, basically just turn that further down. And while some of these capacitors are used as parts of RC circuits in order to virtually block the direct current component within the signals, most of these resistors and capacitors here are part of RC filters intended to de-emphasize or emphasize certain parts within the audio frequency range. And well, that's one explanation why this potentiometer looks so complicated and has so many tabs and parts connected to it. But right now we have the practical problem that the pot doesn't really move. When I try to turn it, it wiggles around, but the axle doesn't really revolve inside the pot, meaning that the ratios between the two resistances of the voltage divider don't change and therefore there is no voltage or volume adjustment. So that means that I have to take it out and, well, get it running again. For that, a whole lot is necessary. And while I'm doing that, I'm fixing a bunch of smaller issues. First, I'm gluing the ferrite rod back into place. I'm doing that with a little MS polymer. Doesn't look too nice, but at least it's not falling out there anymore. The next thing that I found are these brittle rubber parts here that I think are shock absorbers so that the glass panel doesn't really bang against the wooden enclosure all that hard when you move the enclosure or something like that. Then I also find the broken light bulb. It's a 7 volts 0.3 amps light bulb and of course I have some old box with old used light bulbs and I found something that is close enough and I replaced that bulb. So that the next thing is now to actually reach the pot and take it out, but that isn't all that easy. Because I cannot reach the nut holding the pot without removing the glass panel. In order to do that, all the knobs had to be unscrewed 
and a lot of other things had to be loosened also parts of the power supply unit. But eventually I was able to actually reach the pot, then desolder all of the wires and capacitors connecting to it basically, and now I have it actually pulled out. But no matter how hard I try, I cannot get the axle to revolve around inside the potentiometer. And this is a very typical problem with old audio devices. And what happened here is that grease inside the pot became basically a resin over the years or decades and now it's totally stuck. So what I have to do is to open the enclosure of the pot and I do that by bending over six little metal hooks all around the enclosure of the potentiometer and now I can pull it apart. And now I have to remove the axle from inside that front part of the pot and for that I have to heat it up. I use a hot air gun or in this case actually a hair dryer to warm it up. And now I can wiggle around the axle and eventually pull it or push it out of that other part. And now I have to remove that old grease. You can see that here. And you can do that with a strong solvent like for example universal thinner or in this case here gasoline. And I'm actually submersing parts of the pot within a glass filled with gasoline. I recommend not to use drinking glasses for this. This is dangerous because someone could drink out of it. But well, I had nothing else at hand. So all the old grease is removed and then new grease is applied and the pot is put back together. But this is a delicate issue. You should also clean all the contacts inside and don't forget the little graphite parts here that have to be reinserted into the pot. So I put that all back together, install the pot again inside the chassis and solder everything back in place. So the remaining technical issue is that with the AM radios variable capacitor or actually capacitors because they are two inside one enclosure. And as you can see, I'm trying to turn that knob and a spring is put under tension, but this actual variable capacitor here is not turning. It's the same issue as with the volume adjustment potentiometer. It got stuck because of old grease. So what I have to do again is to remove the connections on the bottom side of the variable capacitors. Then I have to unscrew that thing and pull it out. But this time I quickly swap it with another variable capacitor because one of the most annoying things about replacing or repairing these things are the little ropes that are used in order to move the dial. You don't want to change the setup of that. Just keep it as it were and use something to hold these little pulleys in place while you actually get the variable capacitor running again. So what I have to do is to basically remove the little bushing or bearing here. And this time I'm not using gasoline, but universal thinner just to show that that works as well. I again remove the old grease and put everything back together again. Before pulling these variable capacitors apart though, there's one thing you should know. There are various gears in here, reduction gears. And there's a set of cogwheels here, a set of gears of the same size with the same number of teeth. And they're sitting on the same axle. But they're made of different metals. And there's a spring that makes them rotate against each other. And I think the reason for that is to absolutely minimize the wiggle room be between this set of gears and the next neighboring gear. So that when you dial in a certain station, the variable capacitor will respond very accurately without any wiggle room. And when you put them back together again, you have to put a little tension on this spring before you put the entire capacitor back together. But this really concluded my repairs. So it was time for the moment of truth.
The original Ninja Turtles is one of the most annoying games I've ever played. You first play it and think, well, this can't be too bad. The control. guys so this was supposed to be the grand finale but unfortunately my video that i just uploaded got a copyright strike because of the audiobook that i played here it's over 40 years old and in really cheap quality how silly is that but i'm sorry you will just have to believe me that the turntable works so if you like this repair job and this kind of video then please give this video a like because i have no other way of knowing and then there will be more good stuff soon